Support comes from... Entergy provides much more than power. We support science and engineering at local schools to build a brighter path to better jobs and help prepare the next generation. Because together, we power life. Entergy. Additional support provided by the Fred B. and Ruth B. Ziegler Foundation and the Ziegler Art Museum located in Jennings City Hall. The museum focuses on emerging Louisiana artists and is an historical and cultural center for Southwest Louisiana. And the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting with support from viewers like you. Reform is in the eye of the beholder. Are legislators doing enough to avoid the fiscal cliff? We got what I call polar vortex. Some record cold, then record warm, now flooding. Nothing surprises me anymore. It's as bad as people say. Sexual harassment in Louisiana. Hi everyone, I'm Andre Morrow. Much more on those stories in a moment, plus a scientific discovery that involves an LSU researcher. But right now on SWI, the state we're in, some of the week's other headlines. You should all insist that we get together, get in a room, lock the door, and don't come out until we got the damn thing fixed. Governor John Bell Edwards gave his budget gap stump speech to the Baton Rouge Rotary Club this week as negotiations continued to sour at the Capitol. Edwards also called for the immediate resignation of Secretary of State Tom Shedler. This follows allegations of sexual harassment. Prominent Republicans say the facts are in dispute and Shedler has denied the allegations, so they say the courts should sort it out. A woman who works in the Secretary of State's office filed the lawsuit last week. The governor and Hunt Forest Products announced the building of a new state-of-the-art lumber mill in LaSalle Parish. Officials say the $115 million complex will create 110 direct jobs and 300 indirect jobs. Construction is set to begin in April and should open for business early next year. The mill will be located in Urania, Louisiana, population 1300. A number of Louisiana restaurants are moving toward menus with a commitment to health and wellness. The Balancing Act will be staying true to their brand while featuring selections that include less saturated fat, sodium, and sugar. The National Restaurant Association says natural ingredients, clean foods, and legit healthy kids menus are among current hot trends. So far, about 70 restaurants statewide have become designated well spots, and they will carry those third-party seals of approval. Brace yourself if you have car insurance. Your rates are about to go up again. Louisiana currently has the second highest car insurance rates in America after Michigan. The top reasons we pay more, a lot of people don't have insurance or have the bare minimum. Many file lawsuits from car crashes. Car theft also compounds the problem. For a second straight year, U.S. News & World Report is naming Louisiana the worst state in America. It compiles its ranking from health care, education, infrastructure, crime, and other aspects of day-to-day -day life. The best state? That would be Iowa. Gus Majalis, Shreveport businessman and confidant of former Governor Edwin Edwards, has died. He suffered health problems for years. He was 83. Among his business interests, the family owned Farmers Seafood in Shreveport. He also served on the State Board of Regents for Higher Education. In the 1980s, both Majalis and Edwards were indicted and later acquitted on federal charges involving health care permits. Majalis went to prison in the 1990s after being convicted of bank fraud. Negotiations are not looking good at the Capitol. House members can't agree on revenue-raising measures to close a billion-dollar hole in the state's budget for next year. LPB's Kelly Spires has been following it. What's the issue here? Well, Andre, lawmakers are just plain frustrated with each other. They know that there are structural weaknesses in how the state generates and spends tax dollars, and those problems aren't being considered this session. They had several opportunities to address the issues over the last two years. 
The problem is that the word reform, it means something different to everyone. The only major revenue-raising bill to see debate on the House floor before Friday kept a quarter cent of a temporary sales tax set to expire July 1st. Representative Joseph Bowie leads the Black Caucus. We have promised the people of this state that we would do a temporary tax, and that would be the means by which we would build a bridge to solve these issues. Uh, all of us are frustrated because we have been inactive. Last year, a task force created by the legislature put together a report that provided recommendations to fix the structural issues, unify state and local sales taxes so they apply to the same things, get rid of the income tax deduction for federal taxes paid, compress brackets so rates can be lower. Those are just a few of more than 20 thoroughly researched suggestions. Representative Jay Morris is a Republican from Monroe. For the most part, this session, uh, a lot of things that people would consider reform are, are not really on the table. Uh, the purpose of this session, uh, which was called by the governor, was to try to get money. Lawmakers who voted for the sales tax bill thought it was the best chance to keep hospitals, colleges, and other critical state services funded. But after several exemptions for businesses were tacked on, other lawmakers complained it didn't accomplish its goal. It didn't do enough to close the cliff. Dems argue Republican requests have been met. Several spending reform bills have been moved to the Senate. First, bills that alter requirements for Medicaid enrollees, a bill to update the formula that dictates how much the state can spend, and a bill creating a website that shows how the state spends its money. Thank Democrat Mr. Representative uh, Walt Leger argued that they had lost White, sight of uh, why they came into bill. session. Why are we here? We're here for higher education. We're here to make sure that those who can't care for themselves receive care. We're here to make sure that the TOPS program gets funded. The vast majority of Democrats voted against the sales tax measure. Representative Barry Ivey is a Republican from Central who pointed out how strange a GOP-led tax proposal must seem. What we've heard preached the last two years by Republicans is we don't have a, spend, a revenue problem, we have a spending problem. Yet, the grand solution for Republicans is to support a sales tax. If it's just a spending problem, then we don't need the sales tax. There's a $996 million hole left by that temporary tax. With help from an unintended consequence of the federal tax reforms passed last year, the state is projected to collect $302 million more in income tax. Representative Stephen Dwight, a Republican from Lake Charles, brought the sales tax bill. Then you take this bill, which is still a little less than 300, I think we're getting closer. There may be some other measures that pass that come up after this. Um, and if not, we'll go into general, into regular session and we'll have to go through the appropriations process. Democrats want one of the bills to compress income tax brackets or to change what can be deducted from income taxes. Representative Gary Carter is another New Orleans Democrat. Poor people of this state are suffering, absolutely suffering. We don't provide the poor people of this state access to early education. We don't provide them access to a quality K through 12 education. We don't provide them access to higher education. But not everyone thinks that would be reform. Reform is in the eye of the beholder. Morris says he's from a district where people think they pay enough in income tax already. We have a poor state, as we're often reminded, and we have low incomes, uh, as I'm often reminded. So why shouldn't we have relatively low taxes? One of the things about the Republican delegation is that its members have slightly different opinions. Morris, for example, is one of the few conservatives who think industry could be taxed a little bit more, that mom and pop businesses are being hit too hard. Ivy is another strain of conservative. He's been behind several bills based on variations of the tax force report. He says there's one reason his fellow Republicans aren't behind him. Instead of focusing on solving the real problems that affect the people of our state, we decide to pay, play political games. What's going to advance our own political agenda? We don't want a Democrat governor get reelected and we don't want to give him a political win by doing tax reform.
Representative Lance Harris, head of the Republican delegation, said that wasn't true. Harris says that Democrats weren't negotiating in good faith, facing Bowie and Representative Gene Reynolds, who leads the Democrats, while he made his remarks. And I got bamboozled coming here if we can't solve this problem. We were asked on several occasions what could pass. I deal in facts. Mr. Bowie, have I told you that every time we've met? Mr. Reynolds, I said, I'll give you what I think will pass off this floor. Morris says trying to understand what his colleagues think about reform is simple. Somebody who pays more thinks it's not reform. Somebody who pays less thinks it's a good reform. So uh, that's, what we're, that's what we're grappling with here. Lawmakers took a vote on Friday to move some of the revenue raising measures. However, some legislators were allowed to vote for others who were not present. We'll be back next week on this program with further analysis of the session. I can hear a collective. <sighs> Kelly, thanks. No problem. The rising Red River this week prompted the governor to call for a state of emergency. There's also concern about other rivers in the state, including the Mississippi. If the parish is seeing anything of concern, make sure you talk to your lobby district or you talk to us directly. Uh, if you see anything of concern, Jen will of course, go out and take a look at it. But you are looking in on the operations and planning staff at GOSEP, the governor's office of emergency preparedness. So we'll go right down the list of parishes, Jefferson Parish. Nine parishes are under an emergency declaration because of flooding from heavy rains. The command center is ramping up and will remain ready until this immediate threat is over. Rivers and streams that are rising because of that rainfall. And continue Casey to Tingle rise. is the deputy director of GOSEP. The river flooding that we're watching closely on the Washita, the Red River, and the Sabine River um, are the result of rainfall amounts and accumulations that have occurred over the last seven to ten days, both in the state and in neighboring states such as Texas, Oklahoma, and Arkansas. Um, how those rainfall amounts occur and where they occur has a lot to do with where uh, the what rivers are impacted and that sort of thing. So it was not something that we weren't watching. It was just a matter of depending on how much rain fell, when and uh, where, where the impacts would play out. And so that's what we've been paying close attention to. The National Weather Service, Parish Emergency Leaders, and Army Corps of Engineer River Forecasters will remain in constant touch with GOSAP. And what about the Mississippi River and impacts in South Louisiana? We're not tracking anything right now, at least with the Mississippi or Chafalaya, that would um, reach um, you know, something that would be historic. I think with Mississippi, it's a little bit earlier than we anticipated, um, and it may not be the last time. We may see an, another rise as the spring unfolds. The LSU Center for River Studies is always studying the dynamics of the Mississippi. Whether it's snow melt or whether it's, it's heavy rainfall occurring. You know, Clint Wilson is the director of the center. 41 percent of the United States, the continental United States, feeds into the Mississippi River. So all the rain or snow that melts, or the rain that falls or the snow that melts there, eventually, you know, if it doesn't infiltrate or evaporate, eventually feeds down into the Mississippi. Wilson says all these different events in different parts of the system start meeting up. That water wants to get downhill and there's kind of resistance. There's, I don't want to say friction is kind of a loose word for it, but that water's trying to get down to the Gulf of Mexico. And so it's got a lot of power. It's got a lot of energy, right? It's trying to get all that water that's fallen over a huge area and it's trying to push it down through uh, the river. And as it does that, um, you know, it, it can only move so f fast. And so, but that water's still trying to push out. So at the same time it's trying to push down, it also starts to rise higher and higher. This time of the year, there's an even higher focus on what the river is doing because flood season is when river silt and sand is mobilized. That sediment is the very ingredient coastal restoration leaders want to use in sediment diversion projects to channel that nourishment suspended in water into our wetlands that are so starved for it. And, and that's one of the, the, the key processes that, that the state is looking at or, or the state wants to take advantage of for the river sediment diversions, right? Because that sand is what we want to get out of the river and back out into the wetlands like it used to do historically 
you know, every time the river flooded. Later this spring, should the Mississippi threaten to push its levels higher than we're comfortable with, that's when the Army Corps of Engineers consider the use of their lines of defense, the massive river level control structures. So then they operate their structures, whether it's the old river control structure, if necessary, like they had to several years ago, you know, open Morgansett Spillway, or they could open Bonacary Spillway. And so those structures and the, man and the operation of those structures really takes off that excess water that may have come down the Ohio, you know, the, or other tributaries. Most of the state woke up to cool, refreshing weather today. Quite a turnaround from how it's been. Shreveport put itself in the record books, though, this past month with its wettest February ever. Any way you look at it, it has been a strange winter. I talked with state climatologist Barry Keim. What happened to our winter? Yeah, it's been a crazy winter. Um, uh, December actually was very normal, normal in almost every way. Temperature was very close to, to, to normal, as was precipitation. Uh, as we get into to January and February, then some crazy stuff started happening. January got very cold. Like very cold. People very cold. will remember it as being one of the coldest in recent memory. Yeah, it, 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 we, got, we got what I call polar vortex. The polar vortex reared its ugly head. Uh, basically what that means is the jet stream shifted pattern and moved to, to the south of us and all this cold air, this big tongue or lobe of cold air came out of the North Pole, might even come out of Siberia, and drifted down into our direction It made the whole eastern United States extraordinarily cold for much of January. Here in Baton Rouge, we got down to 14 degrees. That's right. the coldest we've been since the big uh, Arctic outbreak in 1989 when they had the, you know, the explosion over at Exxon. So we had had snow in December. We had a little snow and ice in January, which when that happens, we're shut down. And then we have the extreme cold on top of that. Yeah, it was it was crazy. And in fact, the, the beauty of the cold was when we had the snow event, it actually uh, you know, preserved the snow. And normally when we have a snow event, it hangs around for two or three hours. I mean, it's a very fleeting kind of moment. But these snow events actually hung around for 36 hours. We actually got to enjoy them a little bit. So. It was, uh, it was pretty remarkable in, in that regard. And then, bingo. The jet what happened to it? The jet stream shifted pattern, and once, once, you know, basically Mother Nature got tired of that pattern. And uh, it, it, you know, we kept migrating back to this, uh, these, these cold fronts pushing through here in January. And then when we get to February, the pattern completely shifts. All those fronts, cold air, are moving somewhere else. And we're under what's called a ridge which means instead of getting air coming out of Canada, we're mostly getting air off the Gulf of Mexico. It's warm, it's humid, and- It felt like summer. Yeah, and we were breaking records uh, in many days. We, here in Baton Rouge, we went for nine straight days with temperatures in the 80s. We hit 87 degrees twice. And I mean, that's incredible for February. So when you look at the averages, statewide January, statewide February, huge contrast. Yeah, so for, for January, let's talk about January for a second. So for, for the state, it's the whole state average together now. So for January 2018, we averaged 44.3 degrees. That's five degrees below normal. Now a lot of people, I've heard a lot of people say, well, this is the coldest January I, I can ever remember. Well, it was, certainly was the coldest in some time. It ended up being the 15th coldest January on record with our record keeping going all the way back to 1895. So that's 124 years. Right. This is the 15th coldest. So it's not the coldest ever, but still pretty darn cold. It puts us in the top 12% or the coldest 12% of, of all Januaries. And for a little perspective, the coldest January we've ever had was in 1940, we averaged 37 degrees. So that's almost, uh, that's like seven degrees colder than what we had this January. So February comes in, and for the state, we averaged 59.2 degrees. And this is based on very preliminary data because you know, the, mo the month just ended, we're still crunching the numbers. But what, what the, the data we have available right now shows us is 59.2 degrees. That's 6.8 degrees above normal. And um, that gives us the seventh warmest February on record. Again, with our record keeping going back to 1895. In January, nobody who's casually looking and freezing and in their coats felt like <laughs> in a week that they would be in shorts. Well, just to show you how Mother Nature works, um, going into this season, going into the winter, uh, we were predicting a weak La Nina. La Nina's for the southeast tends to bring us warmer and drier than normal conditions. 
And so that's what I was expecting going into this uh, this season. Then we had snow. Then we had snow. Uh, <laughs> it you know, the trend. December, perfectly normal. There's nothing out of the ordinary there. January ends up being out of the ordinary, but in the wrong direction. We, we were drier than normal, but we were cold. And then once we get into to February, and we end up, uh, you know, as we know, record warmth, and we were quite a bit wetter than normal, yeah. And now that we're in March, um, March can have some cool days, but the cold, cold weathers, we're not going to see that again, are we? Uh, we've probably turned the corner on winter, uh, but having said that, I mean, things can change quickly. I mean, a shift in that jet stream pattern can, can bring us some, some cold air. We've, we've had temperatures in the 20s, the mid-20s in, in the month of March. We've even had a freeze as late as, uh, you know, the second week of, of April. So, uh, you know. What are your models showing? Uh, it, it's probably over. I mean, I'd say the, the uh, you know, winter, I think we've turned a corner on winter. We're still going to get a, some co cool air. In fact, there, there's some cool air headed uh, here over the weekend. But the polar vortex is not going to be hanging yeah, it's, out it's, it's below not, Boothville or anything, huh? It's not going to be <laughs> brutally cold, but, but we will see temperatures in the 40s. And uh, after what we've experienced over these last few days, the 40s is going to feel pretty darn cold. Right. Well, statewide forecasters say the first 10 days of March look to be seasonal and more on the dry side. Tonight, LPB will rebroadcast this month's Public Square, drawing the line sexual harassment in Louisiana. The first person to call for the resignation of Secretary of State Tom Shedler, who has been accused of harassing an employee, was Republican State Senator Sharon Hewitt. Hewitt was part of the panel assembled in this Public Square. Here's a preview. Women all around the nation are talking about this topic, and this is not just a national topic. This topic involves the state of Louisiana as well. And I think that, you know, we all know that we want to establish an environment where all people feel safe and free of sexual harassment in their workplace. And um, we want to do that in the state of Louisiana. Women all deserve and all people deserve that kind of an environment, whether you're working in state government or you're working in private industry. And so as a legislator uh, and someone who has worked in a very male dominated industry as an executive in the oil and gas industry mm -hmm. and now a state senator also in a very male dominated industry, you know, I see that as partially my responsibility to advocate for changes in the culture in that area and to bring legislation that will help um, move us further down the road to where we need to be. We're all talking about it in terms of policy development and, and chairman of the, the governor's uh, task force. We're talking about that. We will be recommending uh, statewide policy recommendations for sexual harassment. It's an important topic and uh, one that in my own agency we discuss um, at least once a year, if not more often, in terms of training and culture and expectations of employees and our managers. Um, I echo the workplace should be free of any form of sexual harassment, uh, discrimination or otherwise. It needs to be an environment that employees feel very safe to come to work in. So we're hearing about it in the news, yes, um, but it's something as a manager that's always on the top of my mind. We see a lot, uh, a lot of individuals, uh, CEOs, leaders now, turning to their human resources departments asking, you know, how can, you know, we help, how can we change the culture? Um, and. Uh, and we also hear now a lot of water cooler conversations. Uh, obviously, employees now have a stronger voice than ever to bring this, these topics to the leaders and saying, what are we going to do uh, in our own organization, in our employment base uh, to stop these behaviors? From our perspective, uh, we also look at uh, maybe now it's time to address what we see as the real problem. And that real problem is the, the gender inequalities in our workforce. The real problem is is that may be also the objectification and dehumanization of individuals in our workforce. And so I think it's now time that we start not just focusing so much on a, on a PowerPoint uh, on sexual harassment, mm -hmm. that we peel back the layers and get to the real problem. Since the Me Too movement and everything that, that's happened, I've seen an explosion of these claims coming to my office um, in consultation format. But I think Craig really hit on the major point. Sexual harassment is really just a symptom of a broader problem, and that broader problem is gender inequality. And so I think if we look at addressing the culture issues that you all raised when you commented on this issue, empowering women, making sure that pay equity is a priority, passing laws that uh, allow women to become equal in the workforce, we'll see the issue of sexual harassment uh, recede because you won't have the power differential that you have today 
where women in particular are experiencing this type of conduct and, and honestly these stories have been revealing only to men. Women have always known how bad this was. Mm -hmm. They just feel empowered at this moment to really bring these issues to the forefront. But I think it, it really, until we address the broader issue of gender inequality and the cultural change that really all of you have pointed out, I don't think we'll ever really solve this issue, even though we have good intentions with policies, we have good intentions with law, and we should proceed you know, that, down that path. What we really need to do is proceed towards uh, legislation that empowers women and, and allows them to be equal in the workforce. We are dehumanizing women at a very early age. We look at, in the media, mm -hmm. and we look at you know, what we're seeing, what sells products. We're seeing all just we're repetitively dehumanizing women and, and, and objectifying them. I will have a bill in this next session, <coughs> and as I mentioned earlier, you know it, it will address policy issues uh, as well as training. Uh, but but part of what we haven't talked about that is also um, an area of concern is how hiring decisions and appointment decisions get made. You know that was part of what started this whole thing for me was. Um, you know, the gentleman in the governor's office that was a repeat sexual harasser, and he had a, a repeat history of that. And so I think we have to, you know, take that as an opportunity to look at how are those decisions getting made? What are we doing in the way of background checks and, and other things to make sure that we are making, you know, the right decisions and that we're protecting, you know, everyone in the workplace to make sure that um, they have a safe place to work. You can check out Drawing the Line, Sexual Harassment in Louisiana tonight at 9 on LPB. An LSU researcher finds himself far from home and part of a mega discovery that has produced some of the greatest pictures you will ever see. Take a look at what LSU's Michael Polito and colleagues found on this expedition to the danger islands of Antarctica. Those are Adelie penguins, a breeding colony of one and a half million. The penguins were feared to be in decline, but drone photography and close-up photography and high-res satellite imagery is showing that may not be the case. And that's our show for this week. Remember, you can watch LPB On Demand on your phone or tablet with our LPB Anywhere app. The download is free from your app store. You can catch LPB news and public affairs shows, as well as other Louisiana programs that you've come to enjoy over the years. And please like us on Facebook as well. For everyone at Louisiana Public Broadcasting, I'm Andre Morrow. Thanks for watching. Until next time, that's the state we're in. Check us out on Facebook and Twitter and visit lpb.org where you can view more stories and leave us a comment. This program is available on DVD. Support comes from... Entergy provides much more than power. We support science and engineering at local schools to build a brighter path to better jobs and help prepare the next generation. Because together, we power life. Entergy. Additional support provided by the Fred B. and Ruth B. Ziegler Foundation and the Ziegler Art Museum located in Jennings City Hall. The museum focuses on emerging Louisiana artists and is an historical and cultural center for Southwest Louisiana. And the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting with support from viewers like you.